Hey everyone, I'm Alex. And I'm Jack. And we're here to continue counting down the bosses of the entire Soulsborne series with this video covering the 183rd spot up to the 151st. As usual, a thanks must be offered to our patrons who continue to honor us with their generosity. Anyways, let's get into the video. Number 183, Moonlight Butterfly. In the previous video, I described this thing as a, quote, floating green melatonin that'll put you in a coma without needing an overdose or something along those lines. I'm like Uncle June. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. In an actual real life Uncle June moment, I fell asleep watching over my footage of this fight while coming up with ideas for the script. So, like all great jokes, there is a piece of truth to it. I've taken a couple movie courses at college so far, and in all of them I've had to watch some of the most boring, anti-thought-provoking, sleep-inducing motion capture pictures ever made. For some reason, cinema professors think showing me some shitty Eastern European flick as an example of good storytelling instead of, like, the Godfather will amaze me. But anyways, FromSoft had a similar idea putting in the Moonlight Butterfly instead of literally anything else. Of course, it's not a worse boss than, like, the Bed of Chaos, but I'd rather fight the Bed of Chaos. One go at the Moonlight Butterfly put me halfway on the path to Alzheimer's. The Moonlight Butterfly works on a randomized timer where it goes back and forth between the air and munching on regenerative grass right in front of you like a fucking idiot. Annoying as it may sound, I think it would have been cooler if it went to a random spot and the trade-off would be it would take a bit more melee damage and maybe sit there longer. As it stands, it's rarely ever beatable in one go, Unless you're a seasoned veteran and know how to get a plus three Black Knight Halberd before Sen's Fortress. It's not that fun either way, I still have to wait multiple minutes just to get a chance at a couple hits before it uses its AoE and flies away again. Of course, there's always the option of ranged attack, if for some reason you're a bow build. You were probably expecting me to say sorcerer build, but this thing has insane magic defense. It's what you deserve, pussy. Simply the best route is to wait. 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 Wait, 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 and wait some more until it eventually flies down. During this period, which can range from 30 seconds to 2 minutes, the butterfly will constantly fire off a multitude of two attacks. The death reception in this fight sucks, especially if you lock on like I do, so the best way to handle these is either to use a magic based shield or roll as the things look like they hit you. Use this missed roll as an example, early timing does not work here. As I just said, the biggest offense this thing commits, besides 2 minutes of waiting and 10 seconds of opportunity, is that it usually will use the same two moves, the soul spears and six arrows, and only occasionally use the beam or homing soul mass. I just learned upon research for this script that it actually has a secret attack called the soul sphere, but I've never seen it. A bunch of Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 bosses have these 1 in 10,000 attacks that are exciting as hell when they happen. And truthfully, the stimulation of seeing some cool, rare shit might have been like a caffeine injection here, but that never happened, so I just had to stick to mindlessly dodging the same two moves I've been dodging a hundred times a fight for six years. It's just a fucking misery. Sometimes it'll flip to the other side and it's sort of fun trying to hide behind the mini wall, but it's sort of fun in the same way when you're at your grandparents house and find a hot wheel and play with that for two minutes before tossing it aside and staring at the floor again. And it usually only stays on that side for like one move and goes back anyways. Also, feel bad for me, because we do this for YouTube and have to extend a lot of these fights that we'd usually beat much quicker for footage time. I dragged this out to four minutes, but the points I made earlier still stand. Like I said, I had a plus three Black Knight Halberd and like 35 strength and I fucking hate this boss, so I had to hold back my urges big time here. One last note, her theme is pretty good. The rest, if I'm in a very good mood, passes as barely alright, but once upon a time, power drilling a hole in someone's fucking brain was also alright, so take what you will from that. Number 182, Brain Sucker. If you guys haven't noticed by now, I love arguing with commenters about stuff. I give you guys a lot of shit over liking different collections of pixels than I do, but at the end of the day, it's sort of a Batman-Joker thing where it feels symbiotic. Even if you're out there somewhere with veins bulging in your face, death clenching your phone and typing out death threats to the two of us, we love you. That said, I don't foresee that happening as a result of this pick. I'm not saying I personally think Brainsucker is a worse boss than, say, Gravelord Nito, because he's not, but I feel like Brainsucker probably has less fans than Nito does by virtue of being more of a nothing boss. There's just no way anyone on this planet has ever walked into a Brainsucker fight in a chalice dungeon and started jumping for joy like they won the lottery. In a best case scenario, Brainsucker is a pitiable road bump on your path through one of the chalice dungeons that leaves no impression on you whatsoever. 
In a worst case scenario, it gives your brain a toothy lobotomy job that forces you to sit through 10 seconds of agony. No matter how you slice it, he pretty much has a bottom tier branded on his ass cheek for life. Number 181, Ava the King's Pet. Alex nailed the biggest faults with this boss design in Ludden Zalen. Oh yeah, this is Ludden Zalen. Or really, this is Lud or Zalen, with some sort of radioactive Dr. Manhattan skin disease. When I replayed the Souls 2 DLCs, the Ivory King was a standout. I'd say it's just slightly worse than the Iron King, but it's so close that on another day, I'd tell you they're tied for best. My only complaint aside from the frigid outskirts in Lud and Zalen is Ava. I may have had it much higher than 181, but that's only because I've fought it so many times, I don't ever get hit really. The fight is just poorly designed, and like the rest of Dark Souls 2, but especially its DLC bosses, FromSoft's hard-on for rapid weapon degradation is very much still here. I just can't get over the fact that punishing you for attacking a boss is a real thing. Repair Powder takes the longest of any consumable item in the game outside of Bright Bugs, and with a boss like Ava who can cover any distance from short-range paw swipes to mid-range jumping attacks or long-range ice magic, it can fuck you over. The biggest problem I have with this is over-aggression. Only when you time your roll perfectly should you even attempt to attacks, otherwise just go blow for blow and you can probably no damage it. While greed check bosses are, for the most part, my favorite subgenre, the problem here is that this isn't intended to be one. At least not in the same way as, like, Fume Knight. Ava is just not well made and happened to turn out that way. I don't like how it doesn't use its hind legs at all also. It's sort of cool that you can fight it while it's invisible. I'm sure I'll probably even get some get good comments for beating it while I can see her, but the amount of time it takes to reach the priestess's eye and stuff is ridiculous. It's like three quarters of the DLC, and unfortunately the most redeeming part of the run is exclusively with the Burnt Ivory King. I had a good time exploring this DLC to its fullest because it is loaded with useful items, but for this to be the reward for my my hard work is a bonus in the same way Mike Schmidt got 50 cents for Night 6 and Five Nights at Freddy's. Number 180, Blood Starved Beast. It is a wonder to me that the Blood Starved Beast comes out of so many lists only minorly scathed, but I suppose it all comes down to how you feel about the poison. If not for that, I'd say you have a genuinely fun boss buried deep down inside here. Before he starts poisoning you, he's honestly pretty cool. But then he like does, so the gig is up. For me, that is tantamount to taking a perfectly good tortilla chip and using it to scoop up piss and mold from a urinal. As much as I love dodging this guy and dropping crazy transformation attack combos on him, I just cannot stand the feeling of getting poisoned, moving out to pop an antidote, moving back in and then having to repeat it until I run out. Buying medicine is annoying enough in real life. I don't want to have to go through that whole rigmarole in game land. I had to drop $18 on melatonin gummies just a few days ago to deal with my insomnia. $18! Look at this shit, it's worse than a bag of potato chips. What percent of that is air, 40? What a shakedown. I can see the unavoidable poison being seen as a way to raise the intensity by some, but I think it's just too much considering how early in the game you are. If you get grabbed while poisoned, you're cooked. If you get hit at around two thirds health, you're cooked. As funny as it may sound to say, Dark Souls 2 did this same gimmick a hundred times better with the Smelter Demon. This is a weird case because as I said earlier, I really don't feel like it's a pure garbage boss, but it's just oppressively unfun once you hit the last phase and it never fails to soil my mood as a result. At least the music is great, that's nothing to sneeze at. Number 179, Dragon God. Dragon God sounds like the username of some high school dork you'd play in Madden. He may only be 179 out of 193, or the 7th percentile of Soulsborne bosses, but the Dragon God really sucks. He sucks in the same way it sucked when R. Kelly got charged. He manages to create a sort of empty, dark void in your gut, like a black hole for fun. And I gotta get this off my chest, it sucks that all the videos I see of R. Kelly are him being forced to sing for half-naked black dudes in front of a prison camp. Of all the things Dragon God got wrong, one thing I think it didn't was the lore. But the problem with lore is that it doesn't really matter if the boss stinks. People use lore as a point for bosses like NFL fans use sacks as a point for players. And it's valid, unlike discretionary stat use. I could grab some rock on a hiking trail, write down a story, and all of a sudden, it's the coolest rock on the planet. I think giving great backgrounds to crummy bosses should be a given, but it also doesn't really matter that much. Basically what I'm saying is, you can be Odysseus, but if you suck to fight, who cares? Here, they decided that he was an angry god captured and tortured by a primitive civilization and was left permanently trapped in the ancient ruins of their city. 
Hey dude, how about you don't get trapped by a bunch of monkeys considering you're a gigantic fucking dragon? And he's cool in pretty much everything besides the one time he needs to be cool. In the cinematic introduction, you'd think he was the main antagonist, and the post-Vanguard cutscene is pretty dope too. However, I've seen some people say that's the other dragon god, because there's apparently two? Maybe this one was the bottom, and the other one fucked him in the ass so hard he can't move his legs anymore. Like almost every single Demon Souls boss, the Dragon God falls under the category of interesting concept, horrible execution. This was the moment I realized a top-down remake over a simple graphical enhancement, and the removal of the dupe, which they should have kept, would have served Demon Souls much better. The bosses aged horribly. Every single one is lacking in something that a current FromSoft could probably do a lot with, because the creativity and uniqueness in concepts are 100% there. The Dragon God is a stealth fight, but because Demon's Souls doesn't have anything like crouching or jumping, it's a mechanical disaster. There are two magic harpoon guns on either side of the arena that you need to reach to disable the Dragon God, and to get there you need to slowly crawl your way through rubble and hide behind pillars with generally unclear borders. I don't have a problem with the idea, but it takes a long time and the reward isn't worth the commitment. Plus, once again, half the time the Dragon God will just snipe you through a sliver in the pillar and you'll die while you thought you were following the rules. Even after beating this thing probably 10 times in my life, I still have no idea how he really works. He just sort of randomly bobs his head around like Mr. Freeze in Arkham City, but you can't affect him at all, so it's sort of pointless figuring out his vision field. Most of the time, he likely won't even spot you unless you get greedy at one of those pillars where he peers his head right next to. But one time, when I sprinted across the center stairwell where he never usually looks, he saw me and then I died to a crazy shitbox from a laser attack I've never seen. Anyways, once you gun him down, the fight doesn't end. No, this last segment is actually the longest of the whole encounter. What do you do? You hit his chin nail or whatever on and off as he breathes his onion breath that can damage you. I remember a long time ago, when Alex had a PS3 and the original Demon Souls, I died in this phase. I didn't feel any emotional reaction, just shocked that it was even a real thing. Why does he belabor it for so long? In my opinion, either end it after the second one with maybe a third harpoon gun that drills him in the head, or make it like Ceaseless Discharge and hit him a few times and send him into the lava. It drags on just long enough to where it loses its satisfaction completely, and ruins what could have been at least a semi-cool ending. If there were some minor tweaks made here, it'd probably be fine, but in its current state, the Dragon God is a legendarily bad boss that often counteracts its intended design. Number 178, Executioner's Chariot. Over the course of human history, there have been a great number of cruel and unusual methods devised to execute people from milk and honey torture to the death by a thousand cuts. I wasn't in the room when they were designing these or anything, but I imagine that several rather serious discussions were had before putting them into use. By contrast, I can't help but imagine the old Iron King and his officials giggling and kicking their feet in the air while designing this guy because it's just so unserious. They built a giant circle where the whole point is that one guy just drives around endlessly on a chariot and probably hits anybody walking around, but someone chimed in, like, wait, what if they dodge the evil mutant horse and then some other guy's twirling a telephone cord around his fingers, like, dude, you're right, add giant spikes on the wheel so it covers the whole hallway, and then everyone murmurs in agreement. Then somewhere along the line they just kept adding shit for no reason like the safe zones and necromancers in the giant pit until it resembled the execution method equivalent of the color brown. Entertaining premise aside, this fight is unenjoyable on every front. It can function well enough at the beginning, but once you start playing musical chairs with the other guys, it just devolves into an infuriating skeleton orgy unless you happen to have a shield on you. And let's be real, who actually dedicates a quip load to shields in Dark Souls 2 when it has such a badass selection of fashion souls attire to choose from? I'd sooner be dead in Gucci than living with Temu. After that serious buildup, the horse itself is pretty much dead meat the moment you pull that lever. Straggler skeletons can show up and add some shit sprinkles to the Sunday, but unless you were really getting reamed up the ass during that run-up, you should be fine. I will add that while I have learned to deal with it pretty well now, that run-up is absolutely abominable and makes the misery of dying to this boss compounded tenfold. I can only pray that the dudes behind this were all thrown into their own creation at some point. Yeah, I actually don't mind this boss a ton. I think it benefits from being so uniquely creative that at least it keeps you on your toes. I actually fought it on New Game Plus Plus and did the cheese, and it was very boring and time consuming, but sort of funny I guess. And to confirm what Alex said about the run-up, it, uh, 
is not very fun. It is maybe the least enjoyable one in Dark Souls 2. And I know, you're probably thinking the Iron Keep, but does that have the red phantom NPC right outside the fog wall? No. Number 177, Valiant Gargoyles. Watch my gameplay and you'll immediately realize I was extremely overleveled here. But that was fully my intention. This is one of the least enjoyable boss fights across any of the FromSoft games, but luckily it's not required if you just want to beat the game so you can fight them at any level. I'm sure some of you, if not a lot of you, will not like the fact that I essentially pulled a Floyd Mayweather and ducked them until they were out of their prime, but listen to this. If you had a choice between 100,000 now or a $100 stock that'll grow into 10 million in 20 years, which would you choose? There is genuinely no reason to fight the Valiant Gargoyles at their intended level outside of ego inflation. They fucking suck. Why would I? That's like making me hit a bench PR 50 pounds higher than my current one right now. One thing the Valiant Gargoyles do worse than any other boss in Elden Ring, and for the record this is my biggest pet peeve with the boss design in this game, is delayed attacks. They all feel so unnatural. For example, look at this combo. He held out his sword for three entire seconds before swinging. What the fuck? The first gargoyle gets a new axe when you get him below half health, but it doesn't affect the fight that much. It's the same generic stabs into the ground. The second one hops in when the first gets low, and I actually got lucky with AI and killed the non-twin blade one before I could get really ripped apart by them together. But either way, I just don't understand FromSoft's affinity for poison. It's apparently a joke, but uh, it's pretty annoying, to be honest. The Valiant Gargoyles just really shouldn't be a main boss. It's too many bosses put together for no reason at all, and if you haven't before, get used to fighting them way over leveled. It's just the best way to go. Alex speaking, I'd just like to reiterate that people seriously underrate how absurd that poison breath move is. It's just straight up mean. Every time I see them rev that thing up, I feel like the Punisher in that scene where his family's getting shot. It is by far my least favorite aspect of the fight, along with how often your attacks will miss them even if you're standing right under their gooch due to their weirdly high up torso. Number 176, The Gank Squad. These guys are just bums. There is no burning hatred for them in my heart anymore. I still think they're annoying, but I've decided that it's closer to the kind of annoyance I feel when my little cousin would fuck with my DSi by trying to bend it 270 degrees than it is the annoyance I felt when a gym in my area charged me hundreds of dollars or a premature cancellation when I had to leave to college. That gym is part of a chain currently called One Life by the way, and I still hate them. They really don't like it when you throw little chunks of asphalt from the parking lot at their windows, which is information that you can do with as you please. The gank squad can be handled pretty easily by running around and separating them from each other using the arena geography, which is genuinely kinda stimulating. As far as boss fights go, this would probably be one of the easiest ones to dub over like a sporting event. Obviously, I'm not trying to ride into battle for these guys, I still rank them on the lower end, but this is not a fight where I see some guy say he likes them and I absolutely would be aghast. I'm still in a hospital bed recovering from shock after all the Gideon Offnir defenders our last video rustled up out of the brush, so lord knows I don't need another scare like that. I'm sort of on the same boat as Alex in that I didn't really mind these guys a ton. It kept me very engaged, but I can't ignore the run-up, nor the fact that the entire bottom layer of the arena is filled with those petrify statues. Either way, I actually beat them thanks to my butterfly set. Don't let people tell you Fashion Souls isn't practical. And I had a generally fun time figuring out ways to get them separated from one another. Of all the bosses in Souls 2, this was my favorite to mess around with. And you know what? They could have brought back any NPCs, but decided on Havel, Lucetiel, and the cover boy of the game. Pretty epic. Number 175, Half-Light, Spear of the Church. Of every boss in Dark Souls 3, Half-Light killed me the most. It's mainly because I was a perfectionist about my recorded footage, so if I made some dumb fuck mistake, I just let myself die and start over. I can't remember much about fighting Half-Light besides that I was extremely angry and it was at least 1 in the morning. I kept dying to Judicator Argo, who sounds cool, but I got pretty tired of having to wait an entire minute before Half-Light spawns in. By the way, he does not have a crutch. Having to sit through something every time you fight a boss exacerbates how annoying it feels. You're already frustrated from dying, and now you have to restart the album from the shitty intro before you can get to the song you like. And for the record, the song, aka Half-Light, is ass. I don't like it. I wish I could skip it. A lot of people online really do not like the Painting Guardians for some reason too. I'm more on the side of, why are they there? Nostalgia? Probably. To make it harder? I don't even know. They can heal Half-Light, but if you use the Exile Greatsword like we usually do, you can stunlock them before they can even move out of their spawn animation. Half-Light himself is a glorified NPC and is not very fun to fight. 
It's pretty clear this was designed for PvP, but it's so rare to actually get a real summon, and still annoying either way. Plus, what kind of fucking nerd are you to be sitting in Half-Life's arena waiting to LARP as him? The NPC version has incredibly intelligent AI for a throwaway boss, and the music is really, really good for probably the most irrelevant fight in the game. I think the arena design is top notch as well. I don't know why every boss doesn't just have pillars in them. Anyways, those pillars save this fight from falling all the way to the back of our rankings. The strat is to hide behind them while he attacks and then rush him with an R2 so he can't parry you. The majority of his attacks can be dodged by just walking sideways, but the main reason he's somewhat difficult is because it's hard to get in attacks yourself. And also, he does a ton of damage, especially the one Melania type move with his katana. half light isn't that frustrating if you know what you're doing, but NPC fights in general are lame, and when difficult, can fuck themselves. Number 174, Centipede Demon. This has to be the shittiest visual design for a boss and an arena in conjunction with one another I've ever seen. I'm not bothered by the notorious Souls 1 lava brightness as far as finding it physically painful like it is for some, but it is undeniably gaudy and flamboyant. Pairing that mess with a boss who makes the One Reborn look coherent is a great idea, because that way the player won't be able to tell what's going on. Forcing the camera to squeeze in between the player and the edge of the room was also awesome, because that way you can really feel like it's being recorded by a GoPro Hero 2 attached to a guy in a pogo stick. Once you finish the awkward portion of baiting him to walk over to your little safe zone archipelago, it's pretty much just an anything goes clusterfuck of red pixels and bug legs. He doesn't really hit all that hard for this point in the game, so you're usually fine, so long as he doesn't pimp slap you into the Estus soup. It's kinda satisfying cutting off his tail and getting the lava ring early if I had to give one little wink of praise. I just hope he doesn't let it go to one of his 900 different heads. Number 173, Royal Rat Vanguard. A couple years ago, Alex and I would probably have this fight at like number 100. If a boss was easy, we liked it, but come on, this is as much a boss fight as my left testicle. And it's annoying too. To this day, I have never died to the Royal Rat Vanguard, ever. I've come close an innumerable amount of times, but for some reason, every time I'm low on HP, or about to get poison build up, or petrified because why the fuck isn't that here, they just stop attacking me. In the past, I never had a problem with DS2's boss quantity, but after this playthrough, there are definitely a few that left me questioning why they were ever made. This included. The whole Rat King thing is just a very pointless side quest for a Covenant achievement. The Vanguard and Authority serve as much purpose to the game as Kadarius Tony did to the Chief Super Bowl run. The fight is essentially a free-for-all rodent extermination for a minute, and then Mr. T in rat form shows up. They gave a rat a mohawk, and called it a boss. If the Royal Rat Vanguard didn't inflict poison or petrify, this would maybe be higher, but the principle alone drops their quality a lot for me. Number 172, Ancient Dragon. This fight is just long and rather unforgiving if you happen to be unfamiliar with the way you're supposed to go about it. It's not necessarily hard to avoid his moves, but if he ever catches you lacking with a fire AoE, you're as good as human brisket. Enjoy the super fun and reasonably paced run up back to the fight dude, I just know you love fighting people with giant maces. I actually died here while I was trying to do my no death no bonfire run run time, and that shit brought me to my knees with despair. I don't hate this fight with a passion, but I do think it's totally pointless. For starters, why the hell do we even try to kill him? He seems to be a pretty chill creature to me. I know Aldia created him and he's an imposter or whatever, but so what? I think he deserves to live in peace. These boss ranking videos have me kill him every time, and for what, one giant soul? It strikes me as a little draconian, that's all. That said, I can't lie and say I'm not relieved whenever he finally kicks the bucket after five minutes of tickling his toesy woesies with a greatsword. Boring ass boss, with brutal consequences should you relax for even a moment during his reign of terror. Number 171, True King a lot. Surely no one will get mad at all that we put a boss that can't kill you and is essentially a walking monologue above 22 other genuine, handcrafted fights. And his monologue isn't even that good, or long, and he doesn't even sound cool. He just seems sort of resentful. You know who's resentful? Me! Old King Alant sucks, you're a bitch, and deserve to get cut into poop filet. The only thing I can say about this fight, which is more a remark on the entire remake, is that the old one looks gorgeous. I like how True King Alant looks too, but uh, when I said my left testicle is as much a boss as Royal Rat Vanguard, this is my left testicle. Number 170, Rom, the Vacuous Spider. For some, the cool atmosphere and arena are enough to cushion Rom at a comfortable C tier. These people are generally patient and level-headed, except when you tell them you don't like Rom. 
By contrast, then, you have yours truly, an impatient fellow if there ever was one. If I get stuck behind slow walkers in the dining hall for more than five seconds, I start aggressively speed walking directly behind them and breathing onto their neck until they get uncomfortable and walk faster. This boss is just an enormous drawn out slog and, to me, is functionally identical to the ancient dragon. That said, she's at least cooler looking and more satisfying to hit, which was enough for me to give Rom the edge if I had to pick between the two. I'll admit that I partly softened on Rom because I got better at the fight, save for that Chalice Dungeon encounter from Hell. I don't know what the fuck she was doing down there, but I wish she would stop doing it. This is a fight that is about 70% unfun, with occasional bursts of awesomeness when you get to damage the boss after playing Exterminator for 90 seconds. Once again, I'm back, playing Devil's Advocate. Let's be honest, Rom the Vacuous Spider isn't that bad. His arena's cool, it's fun cancelling his teleportation, but he is annoying, and a pretty lazy idea. If you're good at managing blood echoes, you can enter this fight overleveled very easily though. I honestly don't mind bosses that force you to be patient, especially here because it's sort of cathartic killing those spiders and seeing the total collective grow smaller after each one you kill. Fun? Not really, but at the same time, a little fun. Number 169. Laron Silver Beast. I don't use the term pathetic lightly, but the Laron Silver Beast is the Artibuco or Condiment King of Soulsborne bosses. He's just so fucking lame. I'm a vanilla saw cleaver slash skill build kinda guy, and with my visceral buffing Carol runes, I killed a depth 5 chalice dungeon boss in like 4 attacks. This thing is as deserving of being in depth 5 as I am for affirmative action. I don't even know if he has parry windows, I think if you just shoot your gun at it, it'll keel over and you can shove your fist up its ass. If I had to praise it, it uh, looks like something from where the wild things are. Number 168, Keeper of the Old Lords. Another lame literally who chalice boss joins the ranks of its fellows in the dregs of a souls list. As tends to be the case with worthless fodder that feel like they were added as Patreon benefits, there is no clearly relevant lore to this guy other than that he is a bitch boy for the Old Lords. I don't even know who the fuck those guys are, the Thumerians? If he's running errands for the Descendant, then he's already asking for a beatdown. Just for that, I'm not letting his hoe ass transition into phase two. Seriously, what a clown. I'm convinced that a defiled Chalice fight with him was just some delusional copium fantasy he played out in his head in his final moments while I stuck my hand up his ass like a sock puppet in central Thumeru. Number 167, Vendrick. More than once so far, I've said that I'm pretty decent at Dark Souls 2. But of everything in the game, Vendrick remains the one I can't figure out. He's my boogeyman. He's the Alex Pereira to my Israel Adesanya. I am very bad at timing my rolls against him. If I didn't go out of my way to collect all five giant souls, which the old me never used to do, I'd be fucked, frankly. With a plus 10 rapier, and at the time, around 50 decks before I used a soul vessel and became the beast you see in my winning fight, I was attacking him for an entire minute and he didn't even register my existence. The overall idea and background for this fight is cool, and for me is the highlight of the whole thing. Like I said with the Dragon God, when a fight doesn't suck a fat fucking cock, lore can matter. Vendrick's summarized story is that he and his brother, Aldia, were attempting to find a cure for the undead curse, but Nashandra began to undermine them. So, as Nashandra drew closer to the Throne of Want, he locked his soul away behind a door in the Shrine of Amana, only accessible to a human capable of defeating him. He then exiled himself in the back room of the Undead Crypt to eventually become a Hollow. Anyways, why do I need to gather five giant souls to get back on even ground? I don't know. And they aren't easy to get either. Really, you only need four, and five is more of a safety measure, but if you want the fifth, you gotta get through the Ancient Dragon. Uh, obviously, we had to beat him anyways. Nonetheless, Vendrick being the reward for killing the Ancient Dragon is like winning a cup of Dr. Pepper after finishing first in a marathon. I've said it a few times already, but I generally would let myself die if I got bad footage of the bosses. That's why in my winning fight, I barely got hit. And also, I just had a tendency to troll basically every boss in the entire series, whether or not it was logical or within my right to. Vendrick is a pretty mediocre boss if that, as he's just a large zombie with a sword who moves too slowly to have any sort of moveset. As you can see, standing right under his surprisingly perked up cannoli, some weird shit can happen. Have any of you ever wondered about that? I feel like zombies would have insanely droopy nuts. Also, he has a really fantastic theme. Anyways, a boss where you don't even have to roll 90% of the time is not a recipe for success. The least he could have done was swing in my general direction, or move, at all. Number 166, Prowling Magus and Congregation. We all jest and joke about these comedians being a free fight, but I'm gonna keep it 100 with you guys and say that I have genuinely come close to dying in this fight a few times. 
And it's all the fault of those fucking crawlers. Like, dude, I literally can't even hit this guy, it's ridiculous. How am I supposed to kill him with a piercing weapon when he's glued to the floor, shining the Magus' boots with his tongue? I guess you could use any one of the other hundreds of weapons, but playing early game Dark Souls 2 with anything that isn't a rapier feels like going to Paris and ordering all your meals from McDonald's. There's some cool lore and the pews make for nice crowd control tools, but that doesn't mean all that much when the magic attacks hit you like a straw wrapper blow dart. Killing these guys is like being a kid and stomping bugs to death with your bare feet on the playground. There's a chance that whatever it is you're messing with will bite you and that it could hurt, but even if it does, it's not like you'd be in any real danger. Also like killing bugs with your bare feet, your time is probably better spent doing something else. Number 165, Commander Nihal. Finally, the first major opinion difference on a boss. Commander Nihal is so unenjoyable for me, I put in a genuine effort to convince Alex we shouldn't count him on this list so I didn't have to fight him. Obviously, he's required, but I guess that shows how desperate I was. Even two years ago when Elden Ring came out, I texted Alex on March 13th at 12.52 in the morning, Commander Nihal is the worst boss in Soulsborne. That's dedicated hating. It's been two years, and I still fucking hate this shit. Now, in Niall's defense, my build was horrible, but it wasn't me that was the problem. I went two minutes with him, basically no damage. Well, a minute 15 was me walking in a circle, waiting for him to initiate a combo. But that should never be how a boss fight works. I'm fighting him, not dodging him or countering him. This fight gives you minimal offensive opportunities, which is a major flaw. And I'd also like to point out, my no damage run came to a close because of a delayed attack. What the fuck is that? He held his swing in place until I rolled. The only time I could get more than one hit off against him, and once again, I was a dex build, was his super combo that he momentarily sits still after. Otherwise, you have to evade, evade, and evade. Almost all of his moves are AoEs, meaning you need to keep your distance, and typically his quote-unquote combo finishers are followed up by two more attacks with his closed-up umbrella apparatus. And I've yet to even mention his two fuck knights that spawn in at the start. I've gotten good enough at Nihal from Endless Failure to handle them pretty comfortably, but that's not going to stop me from downplaying the absolute fact that Banished Knights are the least enjoyable enemies ever designed by From Software. They could be mini-bosses in their own right, and pretty much are with the Crucible Knight. The only thing they're missing are a pair of wings and testosterone. You already know how I feel about enemy summons, and I'm sure you can figure out my opinion on elemental damage too. I've never even noticed frostbite's effects ever, but I still get angry just seeing I have an elemental affliction. But like every boss I hate, Nihal is associated in my mind with an incomparable level of satisfaction, and that's a dangerous thing to consider. Was I satisfied because I had an epic back and forth where I edged out my partner in a tango to the death? Or was it because he was such a gigantic bag of dicks that I felt a high level of relief after beating him because I never have him again? It might be option one, but it's probably option two. Sup guys, it's Alex again. I just don't mind this guy a lot, and once you get to the one-on-one -on -one portion of the fight, I find it rather exciting. You can insta-kill one of his cronies before they even move, and then the other guy isn't too brutal if you're quick on the draw with getting him out of the picture. As for Nihal himself, he's a tricky bastard alright, but I found jump attacks were pretty good at staggering him and making him whiff moves overhead. You could even time dodges more easily, since the delay after a jump attack ends is often long enough to wait out any false starts and makes button mash rolling viable every so often. Definitely one of the harder bosses in the series, but when you start to lock into how he operates, it's quite satisfying. Number 164, Maneater Boar. To me, this is basically just true King Alant, but you can jam your fist into his asshole, which is pretty damn funny. Everybody talks about Bloodborne pig fisting, so I'm sure it's old hat to some, but it still cracks me up even to this day. The amusement I get from this bizarre oversight is enough to propel it above a handful of fights that don't quite elicit something resembling joy from me, so that's something. Other than that, it's fun button mashing giant dumb targets that don't know how to properly attack sideways, which describes more bosses than you'd expect. Number 163, Throne Watcher and Defender. As you can see, I had the first round of the Throne of Want Gauntlet a lot higher than Alex did, but I can understand why he wouldn't like them. They don't really work well together, and the arena isn't designed for a gank at all. The only reason I had them at 120 is because I used Gower's Ring of Protection. It nerfs the shit out of this fight. I've actually been using Gower's Ring for years now, and I'm happy I can finally show it off to everybody. 
Having to use Gower's Ring is more a fault on the boss than it is a cool tip, however, because they don't flow like a real gank and more attack you as two individuals irregardless of one being more offensive than the other. You're sort of forced to either summon Benhard of Jugo or use Gower's Ring if you want to be able to focus on one at a time without getting tag teamed. Also, I went for Fashion Souls over Practicality in my fight and suffered greatly. Gower's Rop is one of, if not the heaviest ring in the game, and I had a crazy fat roll. It was so heavy, I could not dodge the Throne Watcher's basic 3-hit combo. Neither of the two are interesting at all, and they have no unique abilities or do anything notable, besides the Watcher doing the ninja flip from Souls 1. But that's a compliment in the same way it's a compliment telling someone who brushed their teeth their breath doesn't smell bad. They can revive each other, which is kinda cool, but this was the first instance of boss revival in a Souls game, so it's not perfect. If you somehow let them pull off a full heal spell, the dead one will come back with a full health bar. And if you don't have at least 450 DPS, you might find yourself in a nasty cycle. The idea is... Well, a gank. For the sake of being a gank. It's not original, not hard, not anything. Number 162, Ancient Wyvern. Calling this a fight is rather generous. You just sprint through a gauntlet of snake dudes until you get to the end, where the wyvern dies instantly because you club him on the head. I'm not going to diss him on that front, since I'd probably die if you did that to me too, but it's really just not a boss you'd have any reason to talk about outside of a list like this. You're never going to be hanging out in the break room at work and have some guy chatting you up about how cool and satisfying it was to plunge attack the ancient wyvern. It's kind of satisfying in the moment, sure, but a single moment is just not enough. It would be nice if there was some semblance of gameplay that wasn't just holding down the run button until your fingers turn purple, that's, that's all I'm saying. Number 161, Ceaseless Discharge. You don't believe the second half of Dark Souls was made in probably, like, a week? Your Honor, I present Exhibit A. A giant fucking blob of orange, whose name means endless stream of bodily fluid who's also one of 22 major bosses in the main game. I've been saying I bet Miyazaki's final project is going to be a Dark Souls remake, and unfortunately for Ceaseless Discharge, he's probably not making the final cut. Unless he does. And then I'm wrong. I feel like FromSoft came up with that cool ass armor set, realized it'd be weird to have an armor set on top of a funeral pyre alone, a full two minute walk from anything else in the surrounding area, and shoved in an incomprehensible thing next to it to give it some meaning. Really, outside of the fact that it has two legs, what is going on? As much stick as people give Ceaseless Discharge, he does feature a very cool and unique trait. He can be killed in multiple ways. That said, I think I'm maybe the only human to ever actually fight him. I'm like the first man on the moon, but for ceaseless discharge. I'll call myself... the... Discharge... Walker. As funny as it is seeing the thing actually fight back because nobody's ever fought him this way, it's pretty clear this wasn't the intended way to go about him. Which I mean then, you made a boss so you can skip that boss? I don't know. In the beginning, he has a couple variations on a slam attack, but once he moves out of his safety spot, he has one single move, wherein he randomly flails his leg dick in the air and launches a viscous tube of probably not very sanitary discharge at Mach 10 speed. Then, he just rests there, chillin'. Also, he sounds very similar to the last giant from Dark Souls 2. Very odd thing to sample. The caveat with Ceaseless Discharge's passive offense is that he does a ridiculous amount of damage. And if he hits you at all, your window of opportunity during his down period is pretty much gone because of how long it takes to recover. On the other hand, you could just skip this entire thing altogether. If you grab the armor and run back to the fog wall, he'll hop over the whole arena and you can just fist him to death, sending him off the cliff. Then, all the lava disappears because... Well, you know. As much as I prefer the skip because it's way easier and not a waste of my time, I've seen it so many times, I don't really care anymore. I'm still gonna do it that way for efficiency, but it's not for a lack of trying on Ceaseless Discharge's part. He's a really fucking stupid boss, but at least he has a solid humor quality to him. Number 160, Merciless Watchers. A little known fun fact is that these guys are called the Merciless Watchers because they love to watch you mercilessly kill their brethren and do nothing about anything. All it takes is a little thoughtful arena geometry navigation and you can pummel them one at a time to your heart's content, while the other two pull up a cuck chair and gaze wistfully onwards from across the room. I give them a little credit for having weapon variety amongst themselves, so it's not all bad. It's fun slapping them up on their fat albino ass cheeks with cleavers or sledgehammers or whatever, which is more than the people below them can say. I really don't have beef with them, I really don't. They're just another tolerable chalice dungeon boss. Add them to the pile. Number 159, Maiden Astraya and Garl Vinland. 
For some reason, this is a boss pretty much everyone universally loves. I blame the democracy for giving them good PR, because truth be told, they are not all that bro. I understand the story, and yes, I acknowledge it's pretty messed up to kill them or whatever, but the story would emotionally impact me maybe a little bit more if it wasn't told in the item descriptions of rings and pairs of pants. Don't get me wrong, I love FromSoft's narratives and especially the way they tell them, but come on, it's not like a dog's purpose or something. As this story goes, Maiden Astraya is like a sort of Mother Teresa for all the people in the Valley of Defilement slowly dying from the plague. Her arena is technically a sanctuary for all these people who are about to die, but what kind of sanctuary has a floor made of blood and a bunch of blood babies trying to suck you in it? Call me overly critical, but maybe make it a bit brighter. Like a children's hospital or something, man. But outside of the admittedly decent story, this fight offers next to nothing. Garl Vinland, made in Astraya's protector, does about as good a job at protecting her as a saloon door. I tried rushing made in Astraya and failed miserably because she has her real protector right next to her, that fucking rock that juts out to the right of her head. But either way, that bum Garl Vinland took almost 30 seconds to get there, and he didn't even kill me. Astraya and the plague got to me before the dude carrying around a human-sized hammer, and if I hadn't kept hitting the rock, I probably could have gotten her anyways. Either way, this is what everyone calls the best boss in Demon Souls? Yeah, right. Demon Souls doesn't have a particularly strong roster, but these two are nowhere near elite. For all the buildup and suffering of 5-1 and 5-2, Garl Vinland at the end was nice in that he was easy, but underwhelming in that he was easy. He camps the same spot and only swings at you when you get in close, and simply put, he's no better than a generic enemy. The quickest way to get him is backstabs, and sometimes his AI will bug out and he'll just start walking backwards for no reason, giving even more openings for backstabs. Otherwise, he takes so long recovering between swings that you can hit him 3-4 to four times after each attack. He'll also occasionally stun himself by slamming slamming his Brampt into the wall next to him. Once you kill him, Astraya kills herself and you close the book on what could arguably be the worst area in Soulsborne. They're not terrible or anything, but I'm down on Maiden Astraya because everyone else is so up on them. Why are they so good? Feel free to let me know in the comments. Number 158, Astel, Natural Born of the Void. This is gonna make everybody shit themselves, I just know it. All the time I see people creaming their panties over how cool this is and saying he's an A-tier boss. He's hard carried by his design and world building function, but mechanically he's just kinda there. His lore isn't even that deep. He's an alien, bro! Wow! Wow! He's not even a unique, noteworthy creature. Astel is a whole species, and that's why there's a random second one just mucking around in a random cave. Literally a glorified falling star beast, although thankfully less horrible to fight. I still don't like his grab move or his teleporting, or how many of his moves are dealt with by just running around. It's a slower paced fight than most in Elden Ring and I'm not a fan. To me it's basically just Elden Beast but slightly worse because he's less satisfying to hit and more likely to hit me with a grab attack. Fuck grab attacks by the way, unless it's being performed by Horalu or the Iron Golem, I hate him. More on those guys way later. Looking back, I gave this thing a bit too much love, I think. It's mainly that it's my favorite boss in the entire series. Like Alex said, it's slow, and sometimes a change of pace is nice, but it's slow because it runs away so often that half the fight is spent holding down circle trying to keep close to it. Otherwise, it's alright. It was fun hitting its head, but it overused the same few attacks and got repetitive fairly quickly. Number 157, Giant Lord. He may be the Giant Lord, but he's also probably a nepotism baby. There's a 0% chance this fucking guy is the mighty ruler of all those other giants who are all harder than him. The biggest thing Giant Lord has going for him is the set piece and partially lore too. Supposedly he's the last giant, just in a flashback before they lost the war and when he was the king of the giants. And it's pretty fucking cool fighting him in the middle of a war zone whether or not he's a below average boss. He's the last giant if the last giant ended up using his arm instead of just ripping it off for no reason. Why the hell did he do that? Anyways, you ankle bite and in the second half of the fight attempt to avoid the sword. But realistically, just eat the hits because there's zero visual cues and basically zero audio cues on when he swings it. Follow these steps and it'll be over in under a minute. For a one-eyed giant with a sword, a cape, and a crown, it's not a good look that the thing most people remember him for is a giant rolling stone head that happens 30 seconds before you fight him. Number 156, High Lord Wolnir. Dude, I'm sorry, I just can't hate this guy. Wolnir will never not be an uproariously funny fight for so many reasons. Lore-wise, he's this enormously imposing figure that was pretty much the Genghis Khan of the Souls world by the sound of it. He slaughtered entire kingdoms because they dared to be born into his world and he smelt their crowns into one to rule them all. 
Nobody fucks with this guy and escapes with their life. Then one day mortality came and knocking at the door and the chuckles begin. For starters, you enter his arena by delicately touching his cup. I'm pretty used to seeing that thing since the Dark Souls 3 dynamic theme in my PS4 changed the trophy icon into Wolnir cups and it was awesome. Thank you Sony for removing dynamic themes by the way. That was a super good idea and everybody is super glad you did that. I think next you should make the DualShock 5 get Nintendo Switch controller drift. Anyways, Wolnir has found himself precariously placed just above the abyss, or at least so he thinks. If you run to the edge of the room, you'll come into view of a wall after a few seconds with no drop off at all. So he was just being a big baby about it, honestly. As for the gameplay, it's just as comical. He's a slow, bumbling buffoon and you can pretty much have your way with him so long as you don't get too greedy and run into the death fog. The one exception is of course if he should summon skeletons, which will suddenly then ratchet the difficulty up a tremendous degree to punish you for your lollygagging. There's this perfect balance of cool yet goofy, having grandiose lore yet a pathetic arena, and being astonishingly weak but able to kill you if stars align or you make the mistake of killing the wrong armlet first. I also give bonus points for his giant sword too, even if it looks like it's made out of jizz ropes. Hey, I get it, not much to do in that little cave room, gotta work with what you got. Wolnir could probably be easily argued into the bottom tiers, and most would probably place him around here where our joint ranking did. But me, I dig him. Dude, I'm sorry, but I fucking hate this guy. I accidentally swung at his right wrist on my first attempt, and if you don't get the left bracelet that first try, it's over. You'll never get a better opportunity than that. In that initial fight, I got so close to getting the bracelet, and then a cartwheel fucking skeleton knocked me into the fog and killed me. My win was 5 minutes long. About four of those spent on the right bracelet. He can summon a sword, skeletons, magic, it can all go fuck itself. I don't care. I hate this boss. It's terrible. And I really hope there are others out there who feel the same way I do. Actually, I don't really hope. I mean, maybe there are, maybe there aren't. I don't really care. Either way, fuck Wolner. Number 155, Yarnum Thumerian Queen. For the finale of 5 Thumeru Chalices, 2 Hintertomb Chalices, 2 Laron Chalices, and the It's Chalice 2 if you're a fucking idiot, Yarnum is a climax in the same way that instead of an explosion, sometimes a volcano will just fart out smoke. I didn't have a lot of trouble with Yarnum, but I still can't disregard the baby mechanic. 1. It's annoying as shit. And 2. It's dumb as shit. I'll never be able to understand boss fights that restrict player movement, especially one where it's most dangerous when you're up close. How do you get trapped? Staying near her for too long during the baby crying. What happens then? You probably get capped. I didn't at all besides that one time on this file, but have pretty much every other time I fought her. Also, she has a baby crying AoE, which gives you very little time to react, and sucks. I think her moveset for the most part is actually a really big positive. She has variety at each range and a very unique set of attacks. Just off the quantity of moves alone, it elevates this fight a lot for me. I also think the story is kinda cool. Supposedly Yarnum was carrying the child of the most ascended great one, Odin. The child's name was Murgo, and while in the womb, Murgo and Yarnum died trapped in the Ihil Chalice. Their souls became separated, leaving Yarnum in the Chalice and Murgo in the Nightmare of Mensis. Whether or not the baby got separated or whatever, it needs to shut the fuck up and eat some Gerber. Supposedly, you're fighting her animated corpse in the chalice. In all these games, there's at least one dead but alive character, and they're always super powerful. Anyways, in the second phase, Yarnum begins spawning two clones of herself whenever she teleports away. Like every other boss who does this, it's pretty easy to identify the imposters, and doubling down doing a physical checkup will kill them in a single hit. Alex may disagree, but in my opinion, this boss does a very good job of keeping you engaged and evolving as as it goes on. Most of her moves get an extra hit tacked on at the end, she begins using her knife more, and in general the fight maintains a solid level of difficulty and enjoyment. Although still, with the baby mechanic and her admittedly slow pacing, the Thumerian Queen is a forgettable boss, only memorable for being the finale of the chalices. Okay, so I fought her on mute because my whole family was asleep and I hate wearing headphones, so I literally couldn't have any idea when she was doing that baby crying shit other than guessing. It's kind of unfair to knock the fight for that because it's obviously not how you're meant to experience it, but I just didn't find it fun with all the teleporting and binding anyways. She's a tanky son of a bitch too, I don't know why they gave her this colossal health bar and let half the DLC bosses die after 30 seconds of sustained sneezing pressure. Number 154, Undead Giant Cannon. The first of the Undead Giants 3, and the worst according to our collective opinion. I actually think this guy is better than the ball and chain version because he dies faster and I have to think about him less. The cannon is a pretty harmless attack, it's easy to dodge no matter where you are so it's not making any trouble for me. 
I am against the inclusion of unmemorable bosses in games overall because they just dilute the quality of your lineup with riffraff, and it has the side effect of torturing innocent boss rankers like me by making me have to find things to say about complete nothing burger experiences. That said, I'd rather go against generic fodder than one of a kind garbage, as said in the last episode. Number 153, Undead Giant Ball and Chain. I actually like this boss a lot. I think the Cannon Giant is horrible because it's made to be beaten by an arcane build. Any boss who's designed around keeping you away from it is just not very good. The only reason I had Cannon Boy at 154 is because it's a low enough depth to where if I pop it zit, I can kill it in one combo. The Ball and Chain variant, however, is much more creative and interactive IMO. It's still an undead giant, so it's not like a mind-blowing fight, but I think of the three, this one is the best by far. For one, it does so much damage it keeps you on your toes. And not only that, but it can defend itself no matter where you are. Debatably, too many Bloodborne bosses get neutered by hiding behind them or under their legs, so when they're able to competently get you from anywhere, I feel like it's much more exciting and more rewarding when you win. I mean, really, it's the blade giant with a ball and chain and a big club it can use for cool AoE sometimes. Should I put it at 82? Uh, looking back, probably not, but that's not to disregard the fight, of which I'd say is comfortably the best undead giant. Number 152, Man Eaters. This fight is an absolutely incredible testament to the talent of AI designers back in the era of the original Demon Souls. Truly, one can hardly picture a more talented visionary bunch than these trailblazing mavericks. While most people make bosses do things like attack, chase you or otherwise interact with the player, the man-eaters take a bold step into the unknown by doing absolutely nothing for 40% of the fight. This is awesome because it gives the player time to enjoy standing still and doing fuck nothing, stopping to smell the roses if you will. If there's one thing every video game designer knows, it's that the more time your players spend doing nothing, the happier they are. I'd like to shout out the time on a New Game Plus 3 playthrough where one of them got glitched under the bridge when he was one hit away from dying and I had to jump off the bridge to break my soft lock. It's also super fun being on a tiny little bridge where you're more likely to die from the environment than any actual interaction with the boss. This is the perfect way to make up for their love of flying in unhittable locations and spamming telekinesis at you the whole time truly one of the boss fights of all time. Just kidding guys, I actually think this boss is atrociously designed dog shit. Look, I get that they look cool and that some people love them. It's one of the only fights in Demon Souls that isn't a 1 out of 10 difficulty joke, so it's sort of natural to look to the man-eaters as a stand-in for the traditional best boss in the game role. But I think this is basically the Souls player equivalent of daddy issues. The player, who fills the role of the child, will look around for a father figure, a kick-ass boss fight to look forward to on every playthrough. Unfortunately, this is Demon's Souls, a genuine 4 out of 10 game that's allowed to be discussed in the same vein as the others solely because it served as the barely functional prototype of Dark Souls 1. There is not a single boss that is hype on the level of some of the later series bosses, try as the remake did to remedy this with beautiful graphics. You will instead fill the void by coping and pretending this guy, the penetrator, the flame lurker, or whoever is actually able to go toe to toe with fights like Ornstein and Smo. It's okay. I understand, really, I used to be like this too. Check our first ever Souls video back in like 2020, we put these clowns at number 2. It's okay to be wrong and grow from your mistakes and realize these guys are designed by literal baboons and are possibly the most mechanically dysfunctional boss in the entire series. Now, of course, I relent a little bit, because I did put them higher than a decent amount of other fights. While they're actually on the ground doing stuff, the fight is solid. I just tend to have very, very bad luck getting them to do this for more than 10 seconds at a time, which gets old. An AI update would really do this fight a massive favor, and I'm still a bit bummed that Bluepoint was as faithful as they were when adapting the game, although I totally understand why they didn't want to change much. That is, other than patching out the infinite grass dupe trick, of all the things to fix, why did they remove the one thing that made their game actually tolerable to play back on the PS3? I cannot stand consumable healing item systems. It is an actual fucking chimpanzee design decision. It's like having to drive without getting drunk first. Unbearable. Some people say they'd rather watch paint dry than whatever. I'd say try fighting the man-eaters rather than whatever you think is boring. Try sitting on a bridge for two minutes watching a thing float around while you can do nothing but spectate. Passively. I do not hate this boss. I do not even dislike this boss. I just got trolled by it. And boy, when it comes to wasting time, I can give it, but I cannot take it. My fight with them lasted 5 minutes, and I don't like any of their moves, even the one spiral thing that looks cool. My fight with them disillusioned me so much, I don't think I'm ever gonna replay Demon Souls again. Maneaters, you win.
If not the battle, then the war. You made it onto the video leaving me as a defeated man. And by the way, suck it. Number 151, Dark Beast Parl. I feel like I covered most of the bases here with my Laron Dark Beast segment in our top 10 worst bosses video, part one of this ranking series for those of you unaware. Ironically, I kind of mentioned how I wanted to save more opinions for the Dark Beast Parl segment in there, but I ended up sort of doing the opposite. Parl, like the Dark Beast, is erratic, impossible to follow, really hard to hit, has terrible hitboxes, and everything else you'd expect of a poorly made beast boss. And once you do manage to flip his fuse box, you can combo each of his limbs as he gets up, reset his animation, and beat him in one cycle. In my opinion, this is actually one of the best looking fights in Bloodborne. Of all the possible things the guy who became Parl could have turned into, he kinda hit the jackpot. All the lore about the Healing Church's fascination with beasts and the science behind them is pretty cool, and I really hope they make a sequel or some sort of spin-off to this game someday. At least remaster it in 60 frames so I can see this thing with non-Chromebook resolution. Anyways, Parl is a pretty insignificant boss in that he's so easy whatever he does likely won't kill you, but that's not to say he's chill. Truthfully, of the main game bosses, Parl is one of, if not the most infuriating. Thanks so much for watching and we hope you enjoyed. This is the colossal mammoth entry in the series, so we're through the big one now. As always, stay tuned for the next installment and check out our Patreon if that two-week wait is just biting you like crazy. That's all for now. Deuces.